River Tay in Scotland is one of the world's greatest salmon rivers. As it flows through its scenic and historic valley, the Tay drains an area of some 2,000 square miles and has by far the largest salmon run of any British river. Fresh salmon enter the river throughout the fishing season and beyond, and it was here on the Glendelvine boat pool in October of 1922 that Miss Ballantyne, the Gillies' daughter, landed the British record salmon weighing a staggering 64 pounds. It's also here on the Murthley Castle water, in the shadow of Miss Ballantyne's cottage, that one of Britain's best known salmon fishermen and casting instructors, Michael Evans, runs his spring courses. Some people think there's little to be learned about salmon fishing and that it's all a question of luck. You drop a fly into the water, a fish is there and he grabs it. But I know from years of teaching that if you improve your skills, you significantly increase your chances. Not only that, you also increase your enjoyment of the sport. As a full-time professional fly fishing instructor, tackle designer and writer, Michael travels as far afield as Arctic Russia's Kola Peninsula and Iceland's legendary volcanoes, accompanying groups of anglers in search of some of the world's best Atlantic salmon fishing. Michael's tackle designs include his Spaycaster and Arrowhead range of rods and lines, which you'll see in use throughout this video. The new specially designed Arrowhead Salmon Twin Lines have a unique profile that makes spay casting easier, with extended front and rear tapers and a weight compensated belly. They're ideally suited for the casts shown on this video. Together with Michael Evans' unique spay caster and arrowhead rods, they make the ideal all-round balanced outfit for the casts and techniques shown here. In these videos, we'll join Michael on one of his Tay salmon fishing courses and also take you to Russia and Iceland, always concentrating on teaching sound techniques and giving practical advice. For most salmon fishing, Michael recommends a 15-foot, two-handed salmon rod with a suitably balanced reel and line to match. A lovely way to fish, Phil. If you're learning some of these casts for the first time, it's best to use a floating line. And for safety's sake, always tie a piece of wool to the end of the leader, not a real fly. Although Michael isn't wearing glasses for the purposes of filming, you should always wear some form of eye protection when practicing casting and fishing. And finally, take sensible safety precautions when on or near the water. Always wear an appropriate life jacket and use a wading stick. The most essential skill in any form of fly fishing is of course the casting, your ability to get the fly to the fish, i.e. effectively cover the water. And assuming you have some experience of casting, Let's show you the main casts in the armory of the salmon fisher. In volume one, we'll look at the overhead cast, learn how to do the single spay, and the double spay cast, all demonstrated with a floating line, plus some useful basic tips on salmon fishing. In volume two, I'll show you how to do the snake or spiral roll, as it is sometimes called, and I'll cover the spay cast using sinking lines plus more detailed salmon fishing tips and advice. But first, let's begin with the fundamentals. And to do that, we'll join my course on the River Tay. The first thing which I'd like just to say something about is why do we bother with two-handed rods? Most trout fishers say, well, why can't I bring my single-handed rod because I can lob the thing 40 yards and that'll suit me fine. The very simple reason is that a big rod is capable of casting heavy lines. And heavy lines are ca capable of casting heavy flies considerably heavier flies than you would normally use when you're trout fishing. And that is the only reason why we use big two-handed rods, because in order to cast, in this case, a weight 10 line, the power of spring required to actually cast the line out is too powerful for one wrist to be able to cope with, and therefore to have two hands makes it easier than one. And that is why we have two-handed rods. And the way I like to suggest people hold a salmon rod is to put the butt of the rod into the left hand there, drop the arms straight, literally lock up so that wherever the right hand meets, that's where you should hold the, hold the handle on the rod. And the grip should be very, very light. The reason why we hold the handle in that position is so that the two hands will work immediately opposite the shoulders. 
in exactly the same way, if I didn't like you, I wanted to bash you on the face, I'd hit you from there, I wouldn't wave my arm about out there. Because that is where the muscles are there most efficient, and that is therefore where you're going to need to use the minimum of effort to do the cast. There are two fundamental principles that apply to all the casts. The first is to make the spring of the rod do the work. In order to show you how to use the spring of the rod, let me just demonstrate this. If we hold the rod like this and we just push it backwards and forwards, you can see that the spring hardly bends at all. If we hold the bottom hand still and just flex with the upper hand, you can see the spring works to a certain degree, but not a great deal. What is far more efficient is to move both the hands with equal and opposite force. And the easy way to think of this is just imagine you've got a piece of mud stuck on the end of the rod and you just want to flick it away as far as possible. And you literally flex the uh, wrists and forearms and you'll see using equal and opposite force with both hands and the rod spring loads and then flicks forwards as if we're trying to flick that piece of mud as far away as possible. The second principle is that the line follows the top of the rod because it is attached to it and the top of the rod in turn follows the path of your upper thumb. All the rod top does is to amplify the movements of this upper thumb. You don't need to be a good caster to catch a salmon, but I don't know many good salmon fishermen who are not good casters. In the next section, when we move on to the specific casts, I'll talk about the positions of the rod during the cast by referring to a clock. At the 9 o'clock position, the rod is level with the surface of the water. At 10 o'clock, it's raised higher and, as I say sometimes, pointing to the tops of the trees on the opposite bank. Then higher yet to 11 o'clock and then the 12 o'clock position when the rod is pointing straight up. Behind the caster now is 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and so on. So when I say stop sharply at 10 o'clock, I'm talking about the rod position, not telling you to take a mid-morning coffee break. With a two-handed rod, it's worth beginning by learning the overhead cast, but only because it teaches you to use the spring of the rod. As you'll discover, the overhead cast isn't as good as the spay casts because the spay casts are much safer. They're also better for changing direction, which is a constant requirement in river fishing, and they need less room for a back cast. The overhead cast is made up of three movements. First a lift, accelerating into a back cast, and then the forward cast. For the overhead cast, once again, don't grip the rod too tightly. Start with the rod back against your body. That will encourage you to keep the elbows down. If you tend to start with what they used to rather rudely call the crutch chuck, you will tend to have the arm straight and then tend to lift with the arm straight, which will defeat the object of the exercise, and that is to flex the rod spring. Start with the hands comfortably uh, down below you, loosely on the rod, don't grip the rod too tightly, and then lift. And the initial lift is to lift with the right hand, flexing the arm at the elbow. Lift, 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 to 10 o'clock, and then that is where you will then continuously move forwards and drive the power from the left hand to take the line up into the air behind you. Although I'm showing it to you in two stages, this is a single movement. It is an acceleration throughout. We'll just put the line back, start with it down on the water, tip of the rod at the water. Then we will lift, accelerate, stop at the top. Watch the movement. Lift with the right hand, drive with the left hand, stop at the top. In this case, the thumb pointing straight up. The rod is tipped back to about 1, 1 1.30 and then is ready for the forward movement where I'm going to drive the thumb straight through the butt of the rod at the target and pull back with the lower hand to the left of my belt buckle. So we'll put the whole cast together now. Start on the water, tip of the rod at the water, lift, 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 flick, stop at the top, forward to the 10 and deliver. It's the forward movement finally that you want to be careful of because the forward movement must be to pull and push with both hands to drive the rod spring. And you'll notice that when I'm finished, that arm is still bent. I have not launched forwards, tucked that under my right armpit, and then thrown forwards. So if you find you're finishing any of the casts, spay cast or overhead cast like that, you've used too much shoulder and thrown it. If the overhead cast is done correctly, 
the line should travel backwards and forwards very close together. We call this in fly casting terms a tight loop. If you move the rod in a wider arc, that is to say instead of stopping at the top, you stop much further back and or you move much further forwards and throw with the right arm, the top of the rod moves through too, far too wide a path and you will see that the line forms what we call a very open loop and this is extremely inefficient because an open loop will not cut through the air nearly as efficiently as a tight loop. All spay casts are just roll casts with a change of direction. So let's look first at the roll cast. Now all roll and spay casts depend upon a loop being formed. This is a loop between the rod top and the water, a loop of line which is then flicked out to the target. Now this loop is often called the D loop because when looked at from the side it looks a bit like a figure D with the rod as the upright. Now the roll cast consists of three movements, not two as many people think. It is, first of all, a lift, just as we had in the overhead cast. The second movement is to sweep the rod out, round and back behind you, lifting slightly until your thumb comes up level with your ear. Once you're in this position, the left hand or the lower hand on the rod should have moved out so that you are ready to flex the rod forward for the third movement, which is the hit or tap forwards. Effectively, when you're doing your roll cast, you should be able to lift the line off the surface and almost make it hesitate in mid-air with it straight, ready to be swept round to the side. The line will then drag out, around and behind you with the fly skidding through the surface of the water coming towards you. You then pause whilst the D forms behind the rod once you've formed the D-loop behind the rod, you can then flex the rod using both hands to drive the loop forwards. And this is a short, sharp tap forwards. It is important for all the roll and spay casts that some line stays as an anchor on the water at the bottom. It is not a cast where uh, the line is flicked into the air behind, like the overhead cast. When you want to improve the basic roll cast, what essentially you do is just speed it up. And if you actually lift and sweep and hit to an approximate timing of a waltz, you'll find that instead of the line just dragging round and into position as the D-loop forms, the line instead lifts off the water and actually jumps back into position. So you'll see it goes something like this. Lift two, three, sweep two, three, hit. And in doing so, the line has lifted off the surface of the water from where it was lying below, is swept round, and as it comes back behind and forms the D-loop, just the last three yards or so alights in the water as the anchor prior to the launch of the roll cast. And it is this jump roll cast, as I call it, that is another essential learning stage of the spay cast. When we're fly fishing for salmon, of course, we are effectively casting the line and fly across the stream and letting it swing back onto our own bank. And it is this constant change of direction required that means we need a full-blown spay cast instead of just the jump roll. It is the ability to lift the line from where it swings onto our own bank and therefore is effectively dangling below us to lift it up, out, and project it out across the stream again. Which spay cast you use depends entirely upon the wind direction because they're designed to keep the D-loop safely downwind and away from the caster at all times. In an upstream wind, we always use a single spay cast and in a downstream wind, a double spay cast or a snake roll. So let's start off with a single spay cast. As with all the spay casts, you must first face the target. It is very important that you are square onto the target, ready for the final hit before you start. Having started like this, you will then go through exactly the same movements we did for the jump roll, but you will change direction during the sweep. So initially you will lift, 
and in order to change direction with this cast, this lift must be slightly into your own bank, and you finish with the rod at the 10 o'clock position. And remember, bend from the elbow when you're doing it, and then stop. Then you'll sweep upstream, directing the rod with the thumb that's uppermost on the rod. Sweep that thumb out and around and up until it is level with your ear. Think of this movement of the thumb as if you're sweeping it around the rim of an imaginary plate sitting on your shoulder. Now the trick here is to make the last three yards or so of the line and the leader and fly touch down in the water approximately a rod and a half's length upstream of you and about 45 degrees out with the loop up above it to the rod top. Having formed the loop, you give it just sufficient time to get a grip on the surface of the water before you then punch out. Start with the hands crossed over so that the rod is pointing at the line in the fished out position. Hold the rod loosely. There's no need to grip the rod tightly because all you'll do is restrict the movement. Then you're going to lift slightly into your own bank. We lift up, stop. Then, as we go out and round, we swivel the rod round, back, and up. And it is essentially the movement of this thumb that creates the loop. Because having lifted it off the water, if you look, we lift to there and stop. And it's the movement of this thumb round and up that essentially creates that D-loop. It is that movement that is creating the D-loop. And the path of the thumb will dictate how high or low the line comes through the air and therefore how much will strike the surface. If we move the thumb too low, too much line will drop into the surface of the water too soon. If we move it too high, it'll miss the water altogether and scoot upstream and not form the dealer. So it is the track of this thumb out round the plate and back up to the ear there which will create the loop before we cast forwards. But remember that all these casts depend on getting each hand to do its part of the work. You must swivel the rod with both hands during the upstream sweep. The upper hand guides the line, but if you don't use the left hand to steer it into the water beside you, you will find that it will land in a heap. If I just lift up now and just wrench with my right hand there, you see the way the line and fly skidded upstream? There's no way that'll come off in a month of Sunday. And that was all a product of just pulling with the right hand. Whereas if I steer and push out with the left hand, it will straighten the line. And the line will land rather like an aeroplane coming into land, instead of like a nasty pile of spaghetti. The final movement with all the spade casts is a short, sharp tap forwards, driving your upper thumb through the rod and stopping at 10 o'clock. It is not a massive heave or throw, it is a sharp tap and stop towards the tops of the trees on the opposite bank. Just lean back, look up and relax and let the rod spring do the work. Remember that the spay cast is a product of timing and technique. It is not a product of effort. If you're working hard, you're working too hard. And if you find you have to give it welly on the way forwards, you will almost invariably find you're pushing with the shoulder. A good way to spot this is to see where you are finished once the cast is complete. If you are finished with the right hand thrust out straight and the left hand under the right armpit, you invariably have pushed with the back and shoulder, and this will form an open loop. If, however, you are finished with both arms and elbows bent and the left hand tucked into your belt buckle, you have flexed the rod and not thrown it forwards too hard. Now, you will find when you start to practice this particular cast that there are two particular adjustments that are essential to get it right. Let's start off with the amount of lift. Well, if you don't lift enough, the line won't come unstuck. If you lift too much, all the line comes off the surface of the water and you'll lose the tension for the next part of the cast, which is the upstream sweep. When you move on to the upstream sweep, you will see that as you track around and upstream, that the rod top just very slightly dips down. And it is this dip that we're forming by moving our thumb in the same path that makes the line touch down on the surface of the water. If you don't let the rod top, i.e. the thumb, dip low enough, the line will actually miss the surface of the water, whiz on upstream and effectively create a back cast of an overhead cast, which is no use. If you dip it too low, too much line will actually crash into the surface, and when you come to try and lift off, it'll all get stuck. 
So what you have to do, and this is very important and not as easy as it uh, sounds, you have to be able to see the line touch down on the surface of the water. And the best advice I can give you at this stage is to say, don't turn the head to look at it, but just stare straight ahead at the target and see it out of the corner of your eye. That way you'll see the splash down and you will be able to make the minor adjustments of either keeping the rod higher or lower through the sweep upstream to make the correct amount of line touch down on the surface. And here, and most importantly, you will find that the pressure you need to give the final hit will be entirely dependent on how well you have set up the cast in terms of the amount of line landing in the surface and the quality of the loop forming behind the rod. If you discover that you need to use lots of effort and there's a huge <coughs> as the line peels off the surface of the water on the way forwards, you've obviously lowered the rod too much on the way round and put too much line in the water. If you just hear a thing that sounds like a pistol bullet going off, a sort of <coughs> behind you, you'll know that you've taken the rod too high, the line has failed to hit the surface of the water and the fly has cracked as you change to the forward hit. So try and adjust the lift and the sweep to make the correct amount of line land in the water. Practice makes perfect, but don't forget you'll need to make an adjustment for your height above the water. You can be getting it just right from the bank, but then you find, having moved down into deeper water, all of a sudden, the one that you've just got used to, which puts the right amount in the surface of the water, suddenly leaves too much and it won't come up. And you'll see the deeper you get, the higher you must lift there and the higher you must keep the rod there before you tap forward. If you don't, you won't get the cast set up right. And then you'll do what everybody does, which is to say, I can't get the brute to go out, so what do they do? They try harder. And what they do is they go like that and they heave forwards and open the loop up. And the moment you open the loop, you're locked, particularly if the wind's blowing towards you. Final things in terms of the faults, we've dealt with the amount of lift, we've dealt with the amount of dip to make the right amount of line strike on the surface of the water, is remember, don't show people your armpits, show them your muscles. And if you lift this right arm up too high there, you will pull through the cast like that and spoil it. If you keep the elbow down and fire it, it will go. You must keep the muscles or, or the muscles close to the body in a position where you can deliver a short, sharp, smooth delivery of force straight through the rod at the target. So a good idea if you're learning the cast and you find it's simply not working for you is actually to lift, sweep and stop and see where you've got to. And if you find that elbow or that arm is way up in the air there, then try and hold it down for the next cast. Don't just carry on regardless. The force that you deliver to shoot that particular loop out across the river is equal, whether it be the upper or lower hand, whichever way round, the only problem you will have with it is in here. The muscle power required is the same for both hands. So the main thing to remember is just because you're weak maybe in the left shoulder, if you're primarily right-handed, don't try and force the cast forwards by throwing with your weak arm. Try and just compensate by using a little more with the lower hand, i.e. your best hand at the bottom, in order to flex the rod spring. The double spay cast is only used in a downstream wind because the wind keeps the line and the fly away from the caster. Indeed, it is essential for safety that the fly never goes upstream of the caster during this cast. It involves sweeping enough line upstream to create a loop of line under the rod and then switching that loop downstream so that it remains safely downwind of the caster. Then, as in the single spay cast, that loop is tapped out across the water. And the movements of the double spay cast go like this. Essentially, starting with the rod pointing at the fished out line, you need to raise the rod very slightly to begin getting the line unstuck. You then sweep with the left hand out and across your front to cross the hands over. 
This does two things. First of all, it draws sufficient line upstream to form the loop. And secondly, it gets the hands crossed over, ready for continuing the movements we've already dealt with on the single spray cast. And they are merely to lift the rod with the left hand this time, sweep out and round, up into the launch position, and tap forwards. Once again, the movements of the double spay cast, lift the rod very slightly, sweep the rod and the line therefore upstream, lift slightly, swing out and round and back, and tap forwards to make the line go out across the stream. From the other bank, the movements are the same, only the right hand is uppermost on the rod. Let's look at the hand movements. Lift up, sweep low and slow, up, up, round, back, and tap forwards. Getting the timing right on the double spay is essential because we must reach the exact moment when the least amount of line is on the surface of the water before we punch out. And the best way to judge that is to watch this little surface ripple as the line peels back down and round into the new position. There's where the line hisses through the water. Let's see it again. There's the lift, there's the upstream sweep, then you switch back round, the line comes off the surface and we launch forwards. Immediately that hissing comes to an end. Lift, sweep upstream, switch back down, there's the ripple as the line changes direction and we tap forwards. Remember two things. First of all, when you lift and you sweep upstream, don't raise the rod top too high, because if you come up there, as you swing back downstream, you will dump the line on the water and it will not lift up properly. There's the upstream sweep and there's the line dumped on the water. Now as I tap forwards, the line is stuck and the cast is ruined. Another common mistake of the double spay cast is to push upstream with the shoulder, do that first of all, and then that, and then end up bowling instead of throwing. You must make sure it's more like a dark throw forwards or a hammer tap forwards with that upper hand and not a bowl. When you're learning this cast, you will do this lift and the initial toe upstream to just drag the line into position. That's until you've got the movements right. Then, and only then, you can start to improve the double spay cast by literally jumping the line up into position. And so instead of lifting and just towing the line upstream, we lift the rod and literally just jump it upstream and then switch down and then hit forwards. And by doing it that way, you minimize the amount of line on the surface of the water and improve the cast. The double spay cast is ideal when you don't have much room behind you. But there is another cast which is more efficient for distance casting in a downstream wind. This is the snake or spiral roll which we will look at in detail in Volume 2. In fishing for salmon, you'll come across all types of pool. Really, there is no such thing as a typical salmon pool, but most consist of three main parts a neck where the fast water flows in, a body or dub which is the deeper, slower part of the pool, and the tail or runoff where the current speeds up and leads into the rapid once again. To know where the salmon are likely to be, you must first judge the approximate height and temperature of the water. If you can see exposed stones or shingle, the water is relatively low for the time of year. If you can see submerged vegetation, the water will be relatively high. We'll look at reading the river in more detail in Volume 2, but for now, good general advice is this. When the river is high or cold, concentrate your efforts on the deeper dubs. But in low or warmer water, concentrate on the faster water in the necks and tails. When it comes to choosing a fly, I'm more concerned with the clarity of the water. In coloured or peaty water, I like to use a large, brightly colored fly, and in very clear water, I would use a small, subtle fly. The overall intention is that the fly is seen by the fish and appears lifelike. The first thing is you must always wear a wading stick on the downstream side. That is to say, if, as we're on the left bank here, 
we will be wading in the water like that. The current will carry the stick forwards, and therefore it must be off the downstream shoulder. All right? That is very important, because if you get into difficulties at all, and you're wading out and you're casting down the river, and suddenly you come across a hole, it is there right in front of you to stop you. If you have it on the wrong shoulder, and say I was on the other bank there, and you have it dangling in the current like that, and you get into trouble, sooner or later you will fall over the thing, and it will trip you up. Okay, that's the first thing. A couple more things on the subject of wading. Be very careful of banks like this, because generally speaking, water will tend to come round and undercut the bank. And so one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to step down to the water like this, stand on the edge in order to lower yourself into the water, and the bank collapses. And that is one of the easiest ways to literally break a leg on the side of a river. The best way to get into water off a steep bank is very simply this. It's a bit undignified, but it's a very good way to do it. Just walk down, kneel down. It's one of the reasons a lot of waders have kneeling pads. And then you have distributed your weight over the full length of the uh, lower part of the leg. Put the stick back down into the water there. Make sure you've got the correct depth. And literally walk back in like that. Even better coming out again. If you kneel, you just go like that walk a decent distance away from the river bank and stand up. When you get into the river itself, the most dangerous part is not out there, it's right here. For the very simple reason, in lower water, the light and heat gets through the thinner water and effectively warms it and creates stuff that makes the rocks very, very slippery algae. And the most dangerous place that you can wade is in the shallow water, because that's where it's most slippery, and that's where the bulk of your weight is above the water. The other thing which is very important is out there, you're just that little bit more wary of falling in, and you pay more attention and concentrate harder on the wading. And I've seen so many people go out there, wade perfectly safely down the deepest part of the stream. They'll even take it carefully, starting to come out the river, and then they go, ah, oh, that's all right then striding across the shallow bit and fall flat on their face. So do take care when you come out. When you're in the stronger stream, the best thing to do is to stand sideways onto the current because you present a much thinner profile to the current to get, for the current to get a hold of. You stand here and you fish out sideways on. If you find yourself walking down the pool and it gets a little bit deeper and you're into about there, be very careful of getting frightened and panicking. Because if you panic, the first thing you're tempted to do is to try and turn round, to head for the bank. The moment you do that, particularly if you're of ample proportion in the rear end like I am, you present a large surface area to the current, and it is at that moment you will get swept away. So if you get into trouble at any stage, when you're out this sort of depth, all you have to do is edge your way back towards the bank like this. Downstream, don't try and go against it, just edge your way back until you get the fork out of the water. Once your fork is out of the water, then, and only then, turn round. Lastly, on the subject of wading, an absolute fundamental rule is never climb onto anything out in the river. If you come across a lovely flat stone, even if it's out of the water, in the middle of the river, under no circumstances, get onto it. The downstream uh, end of a rock invariably scoops an enormous hole out behind it, and the current, when you try and get off, even if you do the kneeling trick, when you try and get off, the current will sweep you away into that hole on the downstream end. So you'll wade up to it from the upstream end, think, this is great, climb onto it. The current's too strong for you get it to get off going upstream, and then you'll fall into the hole behind it. When we're river fishing for salmon, the idea is to start fishing above where we expect the fish to be, cast out across the stream, and let the fly swing back onto our own bank. With each cast, we move down the pool, thereby effectively covering the water. The important part is that the fly mustn't just drift downstream. It must appear to the fish to be swimming against the current. So a fundamental error, as you see here, is to let the rod top lead the line around, which just lets the fly dead drift for much of the swing. Instead, if you hold the rod top above the line and let the line and fly hang off the end under tension, 
the fly will appear much more lifelike. This gives you far more chance of raising a fish. On my course I demonstrate how much pull you can exert with a salmon rod. Most people grossly overestimate the amount of pressure a fish feels when the rod is held high. There is very little force being exerted here. To set the hooks in a salmon's mouth, which is quite hard and bony, apply the initial pressure with the rod held low, as you would if you were trying to get the fly unstuck from a rock. That puts on the pressure to drive the hooks home. Then raise the rod to play your fish. You hold the rod high so that the spring cushions any sudden movements and stops the line being broken. You can try this exercise yourself to know how hard you can pull when you have a real fish on. There's one. Let it go. Feel the weight? Yes. I have experimented with a number of ways of hooking salmon, and here are just a few. Ah, ah, lift in, pull like that. And he's on. Lifted firmly straight into him. But the best general advice I can give oh, is to raise is. the rod only once you've felt the him. weight of the fish. As the following sequence shows, do not be tempted to strike too soon. You very often have a salmon follow you round, and he's literally sitting three or four inches off the tail of your fly. And the action of you pulling it away from him makes him just lunge out and grab it. There was one, but he never touched the fly at all, never felt anything. You need nerves of steel for this. You must not move, you must not strike. It's most important to give the fish time to turn down. May come again. Every muscle in your body wants to lift the rod, and you mustn't until you feel the weight of the fish. Oh. Often lessons learned when playing fish are painful ones, and there is no substitute for experience. In the hope that you might remember in the uh, excitement the of the moment, too. here's some general advice. Firstly, don't make the mistake of trying to yank the fish into the shallows too quickly because he can break the line on rocks or thrash about on the surface and that's often when the hooks come out. Then, obvious it may be, but the best place to play your fish is between the bottom of the river and the surface. And in deeper water, there's more chance to do that. It's important to keep the pressure on the fish because some fish will even try to rub the hooks out on the bottom as this Icelandic fish was determined to do. Is him trying to rub his nose on the bottom? It's equally important, if the fish jumps, that you lower the rod top to slacken the line at that moment. And as a general rule, when the fish runs, let him go, and when he stops, put the pressure back on. Then when you've finally decided it's time to come to the bank... Right, having got him under control, I just hold the rod out to the side like that, don't worry about that, just let him go and walk to the bank. The one thing you mustn't do at this stage is fall over. Having got up to the bank, you can then try and bring matters under control again. If you fall over, you'll almost certainly snatch the fly out of the fish or break. The best way to land a fish quickly is with a net, preferably handled by an experienced guide or ghillie. If a net isn't available, you can usually beach a fish, although it takes a little longer. Always try and land the fish upstream of you. Then if the hook comes out, you still have a sporting chance of getting hold of it. Up and on the bank, head up, and let him flap his way out of the water. Walk calmly round behind him. Now if you intend to release your fish, don't lift him into the air by the tail, because this will strain his ligaments. Instead, lift him with two hands, one cradling him under the belly. Then hold him in the water, facing upstream, until he recovers. One of the joys of salmon fishing for me is that they can be very unpredictable. To catch them demands not only skill and perseverance, but also being in the right place at the right time with a good measure of luck. 
A bar of silver fresh from the sea is the ultimate prize. We've had a very successful morning, a lovely brace of spring fish, both caught on the fly and both caught from the bank. Um, we'll just look at them in a little more detail. This one is just uh, nigh on about 14 pounds. Not totally fresh into the river. There are no sea lice on it and you can just see it's just turning away from being that fresh painted silver that this one certainly has. This one is fresh in from the sea and we can tell that by the lice which you can see both uh, underneath the back and although it's difficult to see them they're on the slightly darker part on the upper part of the um, tail by the adipose fin. We can tell how long this fish has been in the river because the lice that are on it are long-tailed sea lice which wouldn't normally survive more than about 48 hours in fresh water. The long tails of course are not really tails, they are in fact the egg, site, the egg sacs of the lice. A couple more things about it, if we turn it round you can see this fish has had some rock damage on the way up the river. You can see where its tails come through the thinner water and it's uh, just a little bit scored there. That's not disease, it's purely damage caused by rocks on the way up the river. Other than that, two wonderful fish. And what more could you ask for for a morning in Scotland? We hope you've enjoyed Michael Evans' introduction to spay casting and salmon fishing. In volume two of this series, you can learn advanced spay casting techniques and salmon fishing tactics. For information about Michael's individual tuition and courses, or for a copy of his latest Fly Fisher's Guide, which contains details of accompanied trips and fishing tackle, contact him at the following